So I'm Daphne Terrace. I'm the Dean of the Edwards School of Business. And it's my pleasure to open the event by just saying a few words. Um, this is the fifth presentation in the Gordon Maureen Haddock Speaker Series. And Gordon Maureen are, are here in front of us in the seats of honor. Um, and Gord will actually be introducing the speaker, which is why I'm going to talk about the speaker series rather than the speaker for a second. Um, Gordon and Maureen are, are very good friends of the Edwards School of Business. Uh, they're among the first people that I met when I became dean, and they have been absolutely stalwarts ever since at every event, at everywhere I go I see them. And they are tremendous, tremendous supporters of this school. I know that Gordon is a graduate alumnus of um, the Edwards School of Business, then the College of Commerce, and Maureen of the education faculty at University of Saskatchewan. So they're both very attached to the university and believe in giving back um, through this speaker series. They're true entrepreneurs. Um, I have them, um, th let me just say, they if you have ever purchased anything at Lululemon or at um, Body Shop, um, or in a host of other kind of enterprises that they uh, had the Saskatchewan rights to or launched. Um, it's quite extraordinary to what extent they know everything to do with that end of the business. So, you know, if any of you are interested in being mentored, I'm, I'm sorry to make an offer, but <laughs> his email is, <laughs> and she would be great at, and so just feel free to just get in touch with them directly. <laughs> yeah. um, but they began the speaker series in 2007. When you first walk into the Edwards School of Business, you see um, in front of you four framed um, pictures of our speakers and the haddocks. And today, um, we're actually very thrilled to add another face, another topic, another interesting business idea, another inspiring guest. Um, and I would like to, um, before I, I actually ask Gordon to step forward, I would like to acknowledge that uh, a homeless guy um, snuck in here. Uh, his name is Nathan Thowen. Did I say that right? Yeah. And Nathan is a, a first year a student at the Edwards School of Business and he's participating in, in the five days for the homeless. And we're hoping that, you know, maybe he could sneak up and get some cookies or some, you know, some food here and that you treat him well and that you sit next to him despite that he's been living in like a sewer for the last day. So, um, Good to have you here with us, Mr. Homeless Guy. And now it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to, um, to Gord Haddock. I'm gonna just fix this, I think. We used to own a music store, so I should be able to fix that. But uh, I just wanna say, Good afternoon, and I'll tell you, a week ago, you couldn't have said that line with a straight face. It's uh, quite a change between 30 below and uh, two above. So so thanks. I just want to make a few thank yous. One is to thank everybody for coming out, all of you people, to thank the Dean and the Edward School of Business for this wonderful venue that they provide, and to thank the most important person who is hiding. Where is she? Jan, where are you? There she is back there, yeah, blending in. Jan, uh, stand up, Jan. That's Jan Kalinowski. Jan does all the work in putting this together, and uh, we get all the, the uh, pleasure of doing it, but she's the legs and brains behind it, so thank you, Jan. Now, the goal of the Haddock Speaker Series, for those of you that haven't attended before, is uh, to expose students and anybody who's interested in entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurial journeys. And as the Dean mentioned, over the past five years, we've had some really great speakers. Uh, our first sp speaker was Brett Wilson, AKA the Dragon's Den, and of course the Wilson Center here. And he announced uh, his donation at our speaker series, which was pretty exciting because it just came out of the blue. Uh, the second speaker we had was Ted Hanlon, and uh, of course, again, that might ring a bell because that's the Hanlon Center for International Business. And that was announced at our speaker series, which was pretty exciting as well. So um, our third set of speakers were Jim and Greg Ewell of PIC Investments, a father and son group. And last year we had a husband and wife, T. 
team of Wally and Colleen Ma from Northridge Developments, uh, successful builders in the province and other provinces too. So I don't know if you've noticed a little theme there. We had Brett, and we'll call him the young entrepreneur, and he would like that. And we'll call Ted a seasoned entrepreneur. <laughs> And he wouldn't like that, but he's not here, so that's okay. Uh, we had a father and son team, and we had a husband and wife team. So can you guess what we're going to have today? You're all smart, and you figured it out. Today we're going to have a woman entrepreneur, and she's standing over there, and her name is Karen Stewart. And Karen has started uh, eight different businesses, and you're just kind of a rookie then, I guess, eh? In your entrepreneurial <laughs> journey. Uh, you got to wait till you get in the double digits, you know. But, but you're young yet, so. Uh, but I think her last uh, business actually ties in perfectly with my opening comments last year about the, the moss. So as we used to own the body shop when we were into recycling, I'm going to actually say some of the same things I said at that introduction. So I'm sorry for those of you who were here, uh, Ralph and I see a bunch of familiar faces. Um, are you gonna, uh, this is a repeat, but it ties in perfectly. What I had stated with the Moz was that the most important decision an entrepreneur has to make is to choose the right life partner to make an entrepreneurial journey with. And you need a life partner that has the same goals and the same dreams and the same values and the same unflinching belief that things will always work out in the end. And as you know, entrepreneurial journeys, unlike the movies, uh, are filled with uh, challenges, bumps, turns, things out of the blue, government changes, regulations. And uh, so you need to have a partner who's willing to go along for the ride and the, you know, the, you know, the successes and the failures, and a life partner that believes in you and, uh, and uh, always uh, thinks you're really smart and really good and you can rise to the next challenge. Now, however, should you not make the right choice of a light, uh, life partner, and maybe your choice was made in haste, or maybe uh, without much thought, or maybe in the heat of passion, or maybe one of those, well, why not things, um, you will need the services of Karen's newest venture, which is called Fairway Divorce. So may I present Karen Stewart. <laughs> Oh, because I've got one. I've got the speaker right here, so I think you can. I'll just wait till, because if I have to stand behind that, I'll go. Okay, good. So you can hear me now. So this is this is very exciting. First of all, it's been a long. I graduated from uh, U of S in uh, 1998. No, 1988. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was 98, because then you know how old I was. Um, and out of uh, a, an MBA, and it was funny. I was driving here. Um, on the way here today, and I was remembering that the last time I, I stood up and I spoke in a group like this is when I was in my, I think my first or my second year of MBA, and I was really, really uh, stage fright. And I got up, I was supposed to do a presentation, and I couldn't say a word, and the professor was sitting there going, like, you could just see X, X, X. So, so it's nice that, that, that uh, you know, 20 uh, so years later, I'm a little more comfortable talking. Of course, I do now lots of speaking in media, so it's kind of fun. And um, I really want today to be about you guys and about sharing uh, with you hopefully some, some good takeaways. Um, this morning I was driving, I have three kids, uh, 16, 14, and a, a 10 year old. And I was driving my two teenagers to school this morning. And I said, you know, I'm going to Saskatoon today, I'll be back tonight, and I'm speaking to a group of university students about entrepreneurism and, and being an entrepreneur. And I said, you know, you've been my kids for a while, and, and is there anything you think that they, I should tell them that might be of value to them? And my 14-year-old daughter, who's quite astute and very academic, says, yeah, Mom, you know, I think you should tell them that you sh they should have the courage to do whatever they set their heart to. I think that they should find their passion. I don't think they should worry about money, because money will come. And I went, oh, that's really insightful, Elizabeth. Thank you. I said to my 16-year-old son, what about you, Andrew? And he goes, nothing. 
<laughs> I've learned nothing with having an entrepreneurial mom. I went, alrighty then. So, <laughs> so, so I just thought it was one of those, those, you know, he has no idea. I'm going to tell him the story tomorrow. But how, how actually that was very funny because, because that's what life's about, right? It's always this balance. You know, if one person's going to tell you how great you are, the other person's about to tell you how crappy you are. At the end of the day, it all works out. Um, so, you know, whether you take something today or nothing, I hope that at least the next uh, 40 minutes or so when I'm talking is uh, a not a complete waste of your time. <laughs> uh, what I thought I would do today is just sort of share with you my journey. Um, you know, uh, coming to speak with an audience like you, I thought, you know, if I was sitting in the audience 20-some years ago, what is it that I would have wanted to hear? And what is it that would have maybe been a pointer for me to save a lot of these ups and downs and these lessons that you learn in, in your later life? And um, I thought, you know, um, the thing that I like to do is I like to read biographies and through different biographies like Trump or Branson, and they go through their life journey and what led them to these different cornerstone, these different turns in the road that brought them to this place. I always find that really interesting because in that is a whole lot of embedded lessons. So I thought what I'd do today is share with you my journey and sort of where I started and where I am today and how it's kind of unfolded. And embedded in there will be a few lessons that I'll share with you. And then um, because I'm a little bit um, type A personality, probably a little AD and D, I could tend to go over the map. So I wrote some of them down. And so then at the end, I'll sort of just go and recap some of what I consider are the key lessons that I've had in the last, um, gosh, 26 or so years. Um, as my journey through the world of being an entrepreneur. And then, of course, we'll have some chances to ask questions and just have a, have a kind of fun conversation after that. So when I look back, you know, the question is, is an entrepreneur, are you born an entrepreneur? Nurture, nature, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think it's probably a bit of both. I think that uh, an entrepreneurial spirit is one that's driven and and a little bit, maybe a little bit of a type A personality, but I also think it's, it's, it's nature and it's sort of ebbs and flows in your life when you meet these different um, forks in the road. And when I look back in my life, I think my, one of my very first entrepreneurial sort of adventures was when I was 18. And um, I uh, saw this really big pink car drive by. I mean, I thought that is the tackiest thing I've ever seen. And then it pulled over, and this woman got out, and she was just drop-dead gorgeous. And I thought, wow, that woman's got it together. So I must have been gawking at her or something. And she walked up to me and gave me a card, and it said, Mary Kay. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, oh, OK. So anyways, long and short of it is, I sort of did some research and decided that maybe that was a way to put an extra, um, extra cash in my pocket. And if I could look like her, that was pretty good, too. So I went to. Um, my dad, and I said, Dad, I, I, I'm 18, and I'm going to university in the fall, but I, I'd like to do this for the summer, and maybe it will help me you know, pay for my university when I'm going through it, Can I, I, but i got to get started, and to start the business is $2,000. And he was like, uh, no, no. Um, at that point in time, tuition was like 1500 so just put it in perspective, OK? <laughs> so um, I said, fine. I said, fine, that's fine. So I went to my room and I made what I thought was a business plan and went to the bank and, and uh, went up to some manager and somehow managed to convince this guy to give me $2,000. Now at the time the interest rates were about 18%, so he was actually probably excited to write the check, but my dad was shocked when I went home and said, I just got $2,000 and you should have seen his mouth. He's like, oh gosh. And the funny thing is, I'm sure that $2,000 cost me. 10 or 15 or 20, I don't know, because it, it took me like forever to pay it back till I was done university. But um, So that was really my first venture into um, the world of entrepreneurism. And in fact, I sold Mary Kay throughout uh, my undergraduate degree. And it's so funny, because I didn't know if I was going to start by telling you the story. And then I'm walking over here, and lo and behold, this pink, massive thing drives by me. And I went, that's a sign. I got to tell them the story. I haven't seen a pink Cadillac for like 25 years. But you have them in Saskatoon. I can't believe it. <laughs> so, so um, and then I remember, you know, if I look back and look at some key sort of turning points in my, in my journey is when I was in my fourth year of my undergraduate degree here. And one of the things we had to do is we had to write a, a paper on who am I. And I can say, looking back, it's the only 
piece report that I ever kept for my eight years at university where I kept this one thing. And I was very proud of it because it really, it forced me to explore who was I. At that point in time, I, you know, I used to say, well, I am what I am. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Like, I don't know. But one little thing I said in there, and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do know I'm going to innovate businesses that are going to change lives, and I want to have a whole bunch of them, but I have no idea what they're going to look like, when they're going to be, or anything. And I fundamentally believe that that moment, when I was 21 years old, laid the seeds. Those are the seeds that set me into a career of entrepreneurialism. So never underestimate those little seeds that, that come up. And when you look back and you're, even as, you know, from when you're a young child and you look at here you are today and all those little things that happen to get you to where you're going. So from there I went on and did my MBA in finance. And then, of course, at my last year of MBA, at the, in those days it was Arthur Anderson was the place to go. And so I got recruited to Arthur Anderson, which was fabulous. And we started with a salary of $27,000 a year, which was like over the top. And um, so off I went to Calgary. Uh, with Arthur Anderson. And, and another sort of rude awakening in the world of business is I was busting my buns and I was, you know, I really thought like, gosh, I've gone to university for eight years and now I'm having to like photocopy and all this stuff. And I remember one day I came into work and the manager came up to me and he said, um, you know, where's your stuff? And I said, oh, I, I took that home last night. And he said, well, if you took that home last night, what happens if you got hit by a truck? And I went, oh. Boy, you know, my value just went, I just don't think I belong here. Um, he told me in that instant that it was really about the business and not about me. And that was a real another turning point. And that's where I left. And I started in the financial industry in 1991. In 1991, I, um, I uh, started in 1991. In 1993, I started my first uh, financial company. And I remember in those days, I had to, I took my student loan my rent, my car, my lease, and I had to generate 10 grand a month. And in those days, that was a lot of money. But month one, I did like 10,500. And I, from 1991 to 2007, when I sold that company, that was really my, my, my journey through the world of finance. And a lot of lessons in that journey. And I'll tell you one of the biggest lessons in that journey, which you got, we faced in 2008, is just because you're older and just because they've had a lot of experience doesn't mean they know better. And um, as I was going through the ebbs and the flows of the market and being so discouraged by some of the decisions that were being made and so discouraged by our system and the way the regulators were handling th things or overhandling or underhandling things and watching at some of the, the, the devastation that was happening in the markets, I really think I started to form the basis of what ultimately became Fairway. Because in my business as a stockbroker and owning a stockbroking firm, um, and it was a, a very, very, very successful um, small boutique, uh, one of the largest small boutiques actually in Canada. And, um, but I learned in those years, I thought, you know, if I'm going to create value in this business, I have to remove myself from this business. I have to sort of live and breathe the words of good to great. I have to be able to have good people building a great company, and the only way I can do that is with systems. And so I spent five or six years ensuring that I had the systems in place within, within my stockbroking firm to be able to create a scenario where I could, I could remove myself from the value. Now, what's very interesting in life, and this is what I find uh, very interesting, if you have your eyes open and your antennas up. And when I say your antennas up, I'm talking about your intuition. I'm not talking about all the stuff necessarily in the textbook. I'm talking about those intuitive thoughts you have, those out in the moment thoughts where you feel like something just blasts you from out of the sky with this idea or injection of thought. And you don't really understand why. Why am I doing that now? Why was I so relentless about creating systems in a business? Because um, that's not usually done in the stockbroking world. The stockbroking world is very much about, you know, I'm a broker and my, what my value and my income is based on my ability to drive these assets. And I said, no, I want the entire team to be responsible for these assets. And what I didn't realize at the time is where I was really laying the seeds for Fairway. And, 
And I was very passionate about what I did in the stockbroking world, and I started six other financial companies during that time. One was in the real estate development, uh, one was in mortgage-backed securities, well, you know, I don't know what happens to that. Um, a lot of um, an insurance company, a mutual fund company, I had my own mutual fund dealership for Western Canada. So I did a lot of innovative startups and sold them all uh, sort of over that, co the, that course of that journey through those years. And then in 2001, and this is one thing that I think is, you know, we set our, we set our course in life and we think we're going in one direction and then all of a sudden, bang, we end up in another direction. I happen to be a believer that everything happens for a reason. I don't believe there's a lot of accidents, especially if you have your eyes wide open. And there's all our challenges in our life, well, however they are difficult or not, are really opportunities for us. And then those challenges becomes our opportunity to maybe make a difference in our lives and the difference in the people we love or in the difference in the business world. And for me, in um, 2001, I had three young children and found myself faced with, with a divorce. And gosh, I never, ever thought in a million years that's where I was going to end up. But that's where I did end up. And so for five years, I fought like mad in our system to uh, save my company, which I had started, and to um, yeah, have as much time with my kids as I possibly could. And at the end of the, f as I was going through that journey, I started to say, you know, this just doesn't make any sense. Like I've been in business for 20, you know, almost 20 years now, and and there's no accountability. Like, what's going on? There's no accountability. There's no, there's no, there's nothing. There's just, there's just pain and suffering. And my business is 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 getting uh, affected negatively. My my relationships are affected negatively, and um, you know, this is crazy. And I was um, one day. I have a, we have a family cottage in Jasper, and I was I'm a road biker, and so I was riding up the mountain one day, and this is about sort of year three of my divorce, and I'm riding up, riding up the mountain one day, and it was about a 15 kilometer hike. And from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain, I literally felt like a, some beam had come and knocked me off my head and said, you're gonna write a book, these are what it's gonna say in the book, and you're gonna start a business. And this is what the business is going to be about. And I got to the top of the mountain, and I said to my sister, I said, i got to tell you something. I said, I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to, I'm going to start a new business. And it was like that. It was kind of one of these laser moments. And I think you think like that, and you think, well, you know, oh, it's kind of airy-fairy, but I do believe if you go through life with intention, if you go through life with direction, if you go with, through life with your eyes open and a bit and trusting, these kind of flash opportunities start to come to you. They start to come into your mind. They start to plant the seeds. So I decided, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. It wasn't that simple, obviously, but I thought, well, um, maybe what I'll do is I'll start with a little subset of, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'll start with a little subset with um, uh, a, a small division in my stockbroking firm. So that's what I did. And um, it just sort of took off like wildfire. And then I thought, you know, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to leave my, my company that I've built for the last 20 years, which was feedingly handsomely, I was making a ton of money, which I do not make that kind of money now. And that is one of the sacrifices true entrepreneurials make when they follow their passion is they go, for, they go for what drives their passion, not what drives their pocketbook. And I happen to suffer that, that disease. So I uh, thought, if I'm going to do this, I am going to, I'm going to, I want to go, I want to go big. I'm not going to go small. I'm not going to leave this, this huge financial little cash cow here and go and do small. Plus, if I'm going to do this, um, I'm going to try and make a difference in the world, not just in my backyard. So I ventured off and I thought, well, first of all, I got to find out if I'm the only bitter woman on the face of the earth or, is, or there's actually other bitter people. Yeah. And so I hired a company out of the States who actually had done all the branding for Donald Trump. And the one thing about Donald Trump, whether you like him or not, he's been a master of, of branding. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go. So I took 150 grand, went down, hired them and said, okay, I got this idea. Um, now what? So we came up with the name, we came up with the colors, we came up, I came up with the model. I didn't totally perfect it by that point in time, but I had an idea. And I did it out of the United States because I knew that the United States was such a massive market. I had to appeal to the Americans. So, uh, and talking about a leap of, uh, a, a leap of faith because 
uh, who knew, right? Like nobody, nobody had ever in a million years taken on sort of the traditional system of divorce. Nobody had ever thought of franchising or, or at that point in time, I didn't know I was going to franchise, but having multiple offices all related in the area of divorce. Nobody, it was like starting, someone said to me, you know, Karen, it's kind of like, it's kind of like McDonald's. When McDonald's came in, they had, um, um, you know, not only did they start a new business, but it was a new category business called fast food. You've created a sort of like a new category called divorce because business, divorce has never been held accountable or has ever been really seen as an industry. And yet to me, when I did my research, being the financial person that I am, as I figured it out, it was a, it was a $20 billion untapped industry, which was to me very exciting. And so, and so then, the, then the question became, um, okay, so I've got my brand, I've, I think I've got a good idea here. I did some market research, found out that the island that I thought I was on by myself was actually massive and a whole bunch of other people were on the same island with me. It's just we hadn't spoken out about it. Kind of like, kind of like in the old days where they didn't talk about abuse. You know, it's only now, you know, abuse is everywhere. We talk about it openly. If you think about it, ten, even five, ten years ago, the conversation of divorce was not in the media like it is today. <coughs> so we're actually starting to talk about it more, which is great. And I certainly talk about it all the time across Canada and the United States. So, um, and other people are talking about it. So I felt that there, there need, people needed to start talking and people needed to start being educated about other ways and challenging the system. So I started the office in Calgary in 2006. And um, in 2006, it just took off like wildfire. So then the question was, well, now what do I do? Like, do how do I expand? Do I? I don't know. I don't. I mean, I've only had one office, and you know, different businesses, but one office. So I thought, okay, well, you know, what do I know about expansion of business? I don't know a lot. So I hired for a lot of money um, Cameron Harold, who was one of the partners that started 1-800 Junk. And um, I said, listen, you've got to come in. You've got to work with me for a year. And you've got to absolutely educate me on everything you know about franchising. Like, just I just got to be a sponge. And um, so that's what I did for a year. And decided after a year that the model that I wanted to use was franchising. Now, if you, when you're growing a business, as you guys know, you, you can grow it many ways. You can, you can grow organically just out of your cash flow. You can borrow money and, and expand corporately. Or you can franchise. And the nice thing about franchising is that you can you can grow faster on basically other people who are investing and putting their money in. So it's a good model to do that, but it comes with a lot of challenges um, as well. And you know, I'm always the first to say that, that when you venture the world of entrepreneurialism, it's not the easy road. You know that book, The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck? Um, I think that's a brilliant book. And it's truly the, the true journey of following your passion, which I believe is probably the most rewarding journey, is, is The Road Less Traveled. And I encourage you guys to really look deep, and because I believe everybody has something really special to offer. And find out what that little seed is and build on it. And, and when I look back now, when I look back to literally my career and all the ebbs and flows, and really if you looked at them separately, you would think that I was some ma major scattered person. But the reality is, is it all ebbed and flowed. It all, I look back now, it's like, OK, I get why I sold Mary Kay. I sold that because I had to develop the skill of reading people. I had to develop the skill of empathy, right? I had to know how to close a deal because I certainly can't negotiate divorces when people are crazy and when, when, uh, if I don't understand people and how to negotiate. And what about my, my schooling? Oh, it all makes sense now. I had to have the, you know, some of the, the soft sides and, the, and the, of the different types of courses I took in consumerism and some of the home economic stuff I took and the, the MBA and the finance. I had to have Arthur Anderson because they taught me the value of process and the how really at the end of the day I don't matter. It's the, it's the business. It's the, the four walls, hopefully, when I'm talking about business, talking about human, not about human beings. And then, and then how my divorce, what a gift. And it is true, you know, you want to you avoid that if you can. But, but I'm very grateful because without that and without those seeds, I wouldn't have be where I am today. And the other thing is, is as we get those challenges, remember that those challenges are your gifts, right? Those are the gifts. Anything that comes to you too easy is going to likely go away really easy too. And it's not something you, you um, highly value. So if I have like a couple minutes, do I have a couple minutes? Okay. I'm going to really quickly, I'm just going to read through because I, I, I want to just read through a, and I was told by your dean to keep this to 10, but 10, but I don't, um, don't follow rules very well. So I'm just going to read. I wrote down some of the lessons that I thought were key 
in the world of being an entrepreneur. In my journey, if I could capture all the lessons that I've learned and put them on two pieces of page. So I'm just going to read them to you. And if anybody wants them, I can get them typed up and send them over after the fact. So, so um, first of all, know who you are. Take the time and space to know who you are. You know, do the alone time. Be, get to know who's inside you, who's in your heart. Listen to those who are learned and, exp and experienced, but trust your own ideas and your youthful wisdom. You know, I want to use an example. If you research the people that Obama has surrounded himself with, it's scary. It's from the financial perspective, it's scary. Here's a young, brilliant man who's, in my opinion, has chickened out, and he's surrounded himself with the people who caused the, the, the downside of 2008. So trust your youthful wisdom. Don't waste time. Be ruthless with your time. Be ruthless about who you surround yourself with. You are the common denominator of the five people that you, are, that you keep closest to you. Read. Become in, an insatiable reader. You know, read all, you know, Brian Tracy's books, The Goals, The Good to Great, Good to Great The Seven ha Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, those are, those are must-reads. Become highly educated in your area of your passion. Become an expert. Do not focus on money, ever. Get some, you know, if it comes too easy, it's, it's not overly gratifying. Be accountable to everything you do in life. That is a huge lesson, and it sounds a lot easier than said than done. And that means when they say accountability, accountability, you know, am I accountable if I get, you know, raped on the way to school? I didn't cause that, but I'm accountable to how I react to that. That's an extreme case, but that is really self-empowerment, and that's what an entrepreneur needs to be because you're always going to be up against challenges as an entrepreneur. The biggest gift of university is not what you learn, it's what teaches what you what you don't know. It teaches you to become a problem solver. I think genius is in the ability to ask the right questions, not necessarily to answer them. Choose a good life partner. 90% <laughs> of your happiness depends on it. That's kind of scary. That's not about that it's somebody else's responsibility, but you muck that one up, oh, it costs you a lot. Um, Older is, is maybe older, but not necessarily better. Always set goals. If you don't have goals that are measurable, you guys know this stuff, but it's key. Intuition sharpen the skill. It's the most, I think it's the most underrated and most important skill that, that we need in our, in our life and in business. Have a clear vision. Always stay focused on the end game. Know exactly where you're going and don't worry at all about how you're going to get there. Because you will get there if you're focused on the end game. Surround yourself with mentors. Innovate, avoid dream destroyers, brand and know your brand, brand yourself and your business, get a coach, always have a coach. I've, since I was 22 years old, I have had a coach. Today I have two. Um, they hold me accountable and they call me on my BS. And my kids do that too, obviously. <laughs> um, the, um, be financially astute, you got to know the numbers, you got to keep control. Always have a plan B, embrace your mistakes and learns from, learn from them and learn to leave your ego at the door. If you look at the, down, the businesses that fall apart, it's because they're, most of the time, because their ego's got in the way. Um, I would say four big things to, uh, to being a successful entrepreneur. Always protect your optimism. Always, always, always ruthlessly, be ruthless about that. Persevere always. There's no such thing as buts. And have your integrity. And know that you can make a difference. <laughs> So we have, um, the company started in 2006, we started franchising in 2008, we have 39 franchises, we're pretty much all across Canada, uh, focusing on the U.S. Um, we grew very fast, um, I would say too fast, you know, if we're talking privately in the room here a little bit. We, um, 2011 is a bit of a cleaning the garden, getting the weeds out of the garden. So some of the lessons of a franchisor is you can get very excited and you get maybe let some of the wrong people buy a franchise. So um, 
very, very excited about the future. I think we're really on the cusp of a, a major change in the, um, the way that people move through the di uh, divorce. We have these sides of the courts on us because of the, uh, courts are on our side because they're trying to clean up um, that. And we have people because they don't want the end of marriage to mean the destruction of all their assets and their relationship with their kids. I am, um, I'm, I'm in the process of creating more products, which I'm excited about. I'm in the process of writing another book. Um, we're, we're selling more franchises, and um, you know, eventually we'll go past uh, North America. Once we probably get to about 75 in in North America. So yeah, no, I think really, really, really big. And sometimes I have to slow myself down a little bit. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, when you are when you're doing the dog and pony show to raise money, because I when I initially started Fairway, I did raise a million dollars just to uh, to help kick us off. And um, uh, obviously, when you're doing a presentation, you have to you have to share what you consider all the uh, the barrier to entry and the risks. And so, one of the big risks I saw was competition, because I thought it was such an obvious. Like, it's such an obvious business, like, duh, why hasn't someone else thought of this? And you know what? We still don't have competition. So, um, you know, Ron Joyce, who started Tim Hortons, said he, there's no such thing as competition. And it sounds really ego, egotistical and egocentric and kind of stupid, but in fact, if you're so focused on where you're going, um, you, the competition, you know, it may come, but we're so far ahead now. Now, I'm not naive. Someone could come in with a lot of money, but what they don't have is the experience and the wisdom. My job as a leader of this company is to be the innovator and to continual, continually innovating because the divorce is being recognized as an industry. And I think we've actually played a role in that because of the fact that we've got so much press throughout Canada and the U.S. So protecting your brand is really, really important, and spending the money on the brand is really important. And, it, and it's expensive to protect it because you're spending a lot of mon money with marketing. Can you share how, uh, or some of the differences maybe in how you market your products or services to Canadians versus Americans? Because you said you started with America. Um, yeah, we started actually in Canada. So I, I actually did all the branding out of the United States, but then launched it in, in Canada before we went to the United States. Um, you know, the the... There's not a lot of difference between the Americans and Canadians. The difference for us really is that our, our country is more unified. Our laws are more uh, similar from province to province, whether it's franchise laws, whether it's matrimonial laws or property laws. In the United States, it's like there's a million little countries. Um, you know, like Texas versus California is just like it's crazy. Uh, so you have to be really cognizant of what the different um, jurisdictions are. And there is a bit of a different, um, a different approach to business in these different um, states. So if you're going into any, the biggest thing is to know the people, to understand what's going on in, in those states and, and to understand the differences so that you can in turn market. The, um, but overall, we're still using the traditional billboards, radio, uh, search engine optimization is a big one. Uh, Facebook, social networking, massive, um, massive uh, um, ability to get to as many people as possible. So that's kind of unified. People and the jurisdictions are quite a bit different, though. Did I answer that? Okay. The, the franchises, uh, which is really exciting as a franchisor, there's not a lot of franchisors, franchises out there available for professionals, right? If you come from a CA background or in the United States a CPA or a law degree or an MBA in finance, um, it's not a lot of franchises that are going to sort of use some of your skill set. So that, that is our target market, those, those types of educational professions. The, um, and they do buy the, the business for purposes of buying business, creating value, creating wealth within the business separate and apart from the uh, practice, right? Because it's a practice, it's me, myself, and I, and my hourly rate. In Fairway, it's I'm building a business. So 
So that's kind of the answer who we target as far as who buys these. As far as the, the acceptance of the legal community, um, being an entrepreneur and being a trailblazer <laughs> and being an innovator is you've got to have a thick skin because um, uh, I get attacked at every different corner. Um, however, I can tell you that the law societies across country, the country have been incredibly welcoming. So I've really gone, I have, I have all my family are lawyers, and so I decided from day, day one to be very respectful and very gracious. And so I went to the law societies and I said, here, tell me what's wrong. Because I'm coming, we're coming. Um, but uh, the, the, the thing is, and I want to actually share that, because that's a really port, a big thing in business. In, 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 I said, we're coming, you tell me what you don't like about it, I'm happy to change it as long as you're treating me fairly because there's a million other mediation type of collaborative things out there. As long as you're treating me like them and you're not just going after me because they don't know where to slot us, right? Nobody's ever branded this before. Um, but they've actually been very gracious. Some, we get a lot of um, sort of, I'll call my age, sort of the middle aged, uh, where, where you're making a lot of money at my time if you're a lawyer because you've been at it for 30 years or whatever. And so I'm attacking that a bit of, like not intentionally, but they get their backs up. Um, one of the things in business I've learned, and I think this is key, if you are going to be an innovator in anything you're doing, is you know if you're pushing at something and it's restricting you back, you're going to have a fight. If you go into things and someone starts pushing you and you just go like this, guess what happens? It, they cave in. When we went into California, which is one of the most difficult places to get into as far as franchising in the United States, they, they had like a panel of like eight lawyers. And they all said, no, 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 no. And I, I had my lawyer actually talk, do the negotiating with them for the first few months. And then I said to my lawyer, you know, back away, back away. I'm going to do this. So I said, listen, guys, I'm coming. So you tell me what's wrong. You tell me what I can change to make you happy. And this is where I say leave your ego at the door because they couldn't find one thing. They couldn't find one thing that was wrong with what we did that would, would be the unlawful practice of law, which is obviously what they're concerned about. So it was a really good lesson. Sometimes if you just shut up and ask the questions and you know, check your ego, you get, you get the doors open wide for you. So it's been an interesting journey with that for sure. That's that was how many courses have you? Divorces. divorces. Oh, sorry. How many divorces have you completed through the whole process? I don't know. Um, you know, we used to keep track. I, thousands for sure, for sure thousands, <laughs> but I don't know. I, you know, I should know that, and maybe that's a number. I should be like McDonald's with those signs. <laughs> that might, that not, might not be good press, though. <laughs> Another question? So, um, I guess in the audience, maybe don't know. Could you explain your value proposition, like what it is that is different than what was going on before? Yeah. Um, and before I leave, could some female ask me how you can do everything? Could someone please ask me that question? Because <laughs> I am a woman, and I have three kids. Um, uh, Superwoman. So, so, so uh, that, that's really key, right? Because when you're taking anything to the market, you have to have a value proposition. So um, just a one-on-one just -on, -one on the system. There's a traditional system where people go hire lawyers, and there's the, the sort of the mediation where people would hire mediators. And in the past, all the conflicted divorces, all the conflicted divorces would hire lawyers. So if I'm conflicted in any way, shape, or form, my perception is I have to hire lawyers. If I, uh, and the lawyers would drive the mediation. So in other words, let's, we can't make our, we can't, we can't come up with a um, agreement about a house. Okay, go off to the, um, to, the, to the mediator and they will help mediate on the house which they call interest-based mediation. Most mediators in the past have come from a psychology background. That's where it originated, from psychology. And then, of course, we have the lawyers who are, come from the legal background. So there is this, these, two prop, these two propositions. Within the system, which I consider all this kind of flowed out of the traditional system, we also have collaborative law. But here is the fundamental problem is that the perception in the marketplace, and that's changing because we're talking loud, is that mediation is for uh, uh, couples that get along that don't have complicated cases. And with traditional interest-based mediation, it takes two parties and brings them to a middle ground. With 
traditional, uh, you probably don't even need to ask me. Just talk to your friends, parents, family, everybody who's been divorced, unfortunately, lots of people. Uh, so you know the problems that are with that. And so what I said is, wait a minute here. We have two human beings who, who once loved each other, who now hate each other. So what attracted them, opposites attract. When opposites try and negotiate or try and mediate, guess what happens? That blows up. So we have to create a model that is going to move people through resolution um, differently than anything else that's ever been done before. I think that's a real innovation that's come with Fairway. So I created a model called independently negotiated resolution, which can apply not only to divorce. If you talk about the future, I see Fairway, Fairway business negotiations, Fairway real estate negotiations. I see as basically in any kind of area of dispute resolution in the long term. So independently negotiated resolution, the value proposition is two people moving through a very strategic, step-by-step, -step decision-making model separately, independently of each other, ultimately coming to the same decision driven by somebody who understands the numbers. Because while people will say divorce is about kids, it's never about kids. It's always about, it's always about money. Once the money is resolved, the kids the best people to make decisions on their children are the parents. And if the money's resolved, the parents are in a position where they can make a decision. So my model was very revolutionary. First of all, I said you cannot commingle the two. Secondly, I said you have to put money first. Thirdly, I said you can't let them talk to each other as they're going through the process. And then I also said, and you have one senior negotiator who's trained in negotiation, either through a background in business or law or whatever, and they have to have financial acumen. So a whole revolution to the way we've looked at um, going through conflict resolution, and the model works. And that's the value proposition. The value proposition is reduce time, reduce money, reduce stress, and save the kids. Those are the four cornerstones of our business. Thanks for asking that. I was wanting to know what would happen if I phoned her up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you're crazy and go back. <laughs> it won't be happening. No. <laughs> Doing for time. Can we have a couple more questions? Okay, two more. Are you on good speaking terms with your ex? Oh, you had to ask that. Um, no. It was lawyer driven. <laughs> you know, it's a sad story, and 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 you know, passion passion comes from funny places in life. But I'm extremely passionate about ensuring that as few people experience what I did. Um, in the course of my divorce, over five years, I spent half a million dollars in legal bills. And I, in the, and over five years, the relationship between my ex and I was destroyed. And my kids are fabulous. Um, we have joint custody. And how crazy is this? We haven't spoken since 2003. I would love to, but he just doesn't want to. So that's OK. I'm kind of OK with that. But we are an example, in many ways, of what went totally wrong, but also that you can empower the children regardless. If you, if you whatever happens, you can empower your children. Um, it's all your perception and your, and you be the best person you can be is what I say, and everything else falls into place. It's a sad story, it is what it is. I've always worked with women all my life, starting in the drugstore, family drugstore. And, yeah, I'm just gonna repeat it. He said he's always worked with women <laughs> from drugstores through to fun show. <laughs> You know, I think when you are doing what you're meant to do in life, when you're following your passion and you're on where you're, where you're meant to be, whether you have a spiritual bent or not, if you feel like you're on the journey you were put on this earth to do, you have endless energy. And people who know me say that. They say, where do you get your energy? And, you know, it's not that I really work, um, you know, I probably do work harder than other people. But, <laughs> but you know, I have three, I'm a you know, my kids come first. My, I'm a mummy first. There's no question about it. They would tell you I was a mummy first. Um, I, I, you can have, you can have it all. You really can. When you are, 
laser, if you're, if you're in a place of passion, it is that you can have it all. And I'm a real believer that if you look at somebody's lives and you look at their financial situation, their personal situation, their, all their, their health, and you go to the, the, the lowest one, um, you can, unfortunately, that is the one that you bring everything down to. Everything tends to fall by physics down to the lowest one. So it's really important that to keep your health, your financial, your spiritual, your relationships all in balance, and then they all tend to rise and, and flourish. And, and I don't, you know, people ask me, and it's like it's, it's not super hard. I think it's also about women are good multi multitaskers, I have to say. We, you know, I've worked with lots of men and lots of women, more men than women, and women are really good at multitasking. It's a talent, I think, that we have. But um, I think at the end of the day, it's about being in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're with your spouse, your children, your, your work, your, your, your spiritual thing, your fit, you know, I work out every day, you know, in the moment. When you're in the moment, I'll tell you, the world is your oyster. You know, I think that's true, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's men applauding. Women yeah. actually work harder I, I, than I, men. I don't. I don't. I don't Thank know. I think. For, I think men work. I think men work differently than women. I don't. I don't. Yeah. Uh, you know. But. Uh, and then, if you like what you're doing, right? It's not work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Take the word work out of your vocabulary. Exactly. You really. Just take it out. I don't. I don't use that word very often. We have room for one. Is it, uh, like, have you had any examples of people staying together through going through this? Yeah, um, I, I actually, a number of our clients get back together in the process. And um, uh, I, I think, you know why? I think it's because uh, uh, they say that divorce is the ba you know, usually because of finance or lack of communication. I've never ever worked with a couple where they say, oh yeah, we have great communication. It's always, we have terrible communication. Um, but sometimes the things that seem like are mountains, when you start to, that's why I'm so strategic and methodical in, in the process, when you start to break them down to their parts, they become less of the, of the massive problem that you think they are. And when people start to see, oh, well, you know what, there is a financial solution to our situation, it actually takes the burden off their relationship and they look at each other through different eyes. I always say to people, you know, I, I talk to people all the time, you know, they, I don't know, they seek me out and they call me and I have to talk to them if they call me. But they, they, yes, I say, you know, what happens in divorce, and this is very sad, and if any of you, I'm sure some of you in the room are products of it, either yourself or your parents or somebody close to you. And you always say, well, you know, what happened? Like those, they were together and then this. When people get divorced, they rewrite history. So that's exactly what happens. If you, if, if when people, two people are together and they be, may be together for 20 years, and those, when they decide to end that relationship, the history is completely completely seen through different filters. And that's why there's a, there's a need for a new model. So people go, ah, that's not the way it was in our marriage. Like, are you kidding me? And she'll go, what do you mean? That's not the way it was. And that, that's the rule. That is the rule. We rewrite history. R you know, reality is perception. Um, know that. Your reality is only your perception. There really is no reality. It's your, always your perception. So if you're arguing with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, remember that. <laughs> Well, let's give her a big hand. I don't know if you've had a chance to see the uh, mug shots on the wall there, but uh, after each presentation, we always give our guest speaker a painting. And, uh, and it's from Maureen's book, although those paintings are all gone. Um, and we've, she's working on a second book. So you're the first recipient of uh, a book, uh, a book two, which is either going to be more get a bigger wagon, or we're not sure what we're going to call it, or uh, more okay. or get a bigger Anybody wagon. Uh, so <laughs> we'd just like to give you this painting. Oh my goodness! The princess, I would expect that. <laughs> 
I'm not kidding you. I'm oh, not. thank you. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. I can't get too close to that and start vibrating. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> 